So without further ado, I'd like to ask Ed to turn on his video and microphone. And uh, I, will, I will drift into the background and chair from a distance. Thank you very much, Ed. It, it's over to you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so hopefully that's working and you can see that. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about my experience uh, at the fire protection uh, field and the, uh, the journey that we have been on as a fire industry uh, in the passive space. So if I, if I give you some, some kind of background and set the scene, in, in New Zealand we've had a performance-based building code since 1992. Uh, and so we've had a building regulatory system that, that sets out a framework to promote good quality decisions made during the building process. Uh, you'll probably hear tonight, as Peter's already set out, the various design stages that are essential to deliver passive fire protection. And what I've set out here is the three main distinct stages that we use in the New Zealand regulatory system. And so simplistically put in my view, if we look at our performance-based building code and the regulatory system that we have in place, uh, for the design stage, uh, we have a number of controls in place. And so at the design stage, we should have a system that provides for suitably competent designers providing the design with an independent design approvals process of that design. If we look at the construction stage, which includes, in, in this case, both installation and inspection of the uh, passive fire protection features, again, we should really be having suitably competent installation and a level of independent inspection and approvals process of that installation. And in New Zealand, we have what we call the uh, building warrant fitness system and a pretty good system on paper that, that deals with the maintenance and ongoing occupation of the building which is there to ensure an ongoing maintenance of the building safety systems, which in this case, it also includes the passive fire protection features of the building uh, and should provide for regular annual inspections of the buildings and the passive fire protection features within them. But as a background to the fire protection problem or challenge that we face, uh, for a long time we've, we've known about the problem that we've had for at least 10 years and we've been talking about the passive issues without any really meaningful change occurring. Uh, so from when I arrived in New Zealand in 2005, uh, the first 10 years were really uh, a, a, a time of talking about the problem, recognition of the problem. Uh, here we've got two examples of, of really the only things that you can really find to, to look at uh, identification of the problem in passive. The first is, was a document that I was presented with relatively early on, which was a, a, uh, an audit of the 15 tallest towers in Auckland that was presented to me uh, from someone outside of the fire industry, uh, identifying that there was serious concerns in their, in their view of the fire stopping that they saw as they audited these buildings. So from that came, a number of years of talking about the problem and, and eventually leading to, in 2008, the Fire Protection Association of New Zealand undertaking a study to try and investigate uh, the anecdotal concerns that the industry had. Uh, and again, in 2008, that that found uh, a number of problems uh, and that the anecdotal issues that were being talked about in the industry were being realised from their independent study. It's also fair to say that uh, or ask the question, so how is it that we've got a regulatory system? How did we find ourselves in a situation where you could walk into a building and readily find passive fire defects? Uh, so part of this problem lies with the deregulation that we saw in the construction industry during the 1990s that came along with the performance -based, introduction of the performance-based building code, which saw untested and unregulated products being used and new techniques flooding the market together with a loss of skills and the subsequent rise of liability issues. Uh, on the screen there, we also had uh, a leaky building, what we termed a leaky building uh, problem, a weather tightness issue problem uh, that started over the years also to uh, change from not just a cladding and weather tightness problem, but also uh, started to uncover lots of penetration issues and other issues associated with the design of the buildings 
uh, which led some in the industry, including that quote there from the Homeowners and Buyers Association to uh, declare to, uh, in one statement, that they, in their belief, uh, from the age of, from the years of 95 to 2005, probably in their view, all of the apartment buildings built for over that period were probably non-compliant and, and at that time probably never were. So many people will be aware of the post Grenfell work going on in many countries and what that is exposing in terms of the fire design and construction sector, particularly with regards to the combustible cladding. But our first cladding crisis started in the, in the early 90s, which, which came about really because of the introduction of uh, the performance based building code. And what you see there is two quotes from a presentation recently given on on the causes and findings of the leaky building crisis that we went through that have been found over the last 25 years. And you'll see that that what culminated from on what came after the introduction of the performance based building code was a was a building boom, which nurtured this toxic environment and and and, and produced or, or came about and produced a, a range of findings, including these, these issues of poorly skilled, poorly trained, unsupervised, uh, new people coming into the market who were under tremendous time pressures uh, using familiar, unfamiliar, unfamiliar designs with untested and un, in an unregulated environment. So we started uh, with our first cladding uh, crisis 25 years ago, uh, followed by a building boom. And 25 years later today, we are still in the situation of having a building boom, uh, the biggest we've ever seen. And 25 years later, we would probably suggest that those, those issues that were found that created the leaky building crisis in New Zealand from the 90s onwards are still relevant today. And so what is the answer to the problem that we've got in the passive industry? Well, again, if we look back at uh, what we knew back uh, in the early 90s and what we knew that would what would be required in terms of uh, the requirements to uh, to implement a performance based building code successfully of course what we knew then was that it would require significant uh, levels of education uh, to provide the the industry with uh, successful uh, uh, or, or the or the understanding that they needed to successfully implement a performance based building code and really, that's the crux of, of, of where, we've, where we've come to in the passive industry in terms of understanding that educational requirements and the understanding needs to deliver passive successfully. So the recognition of the passive fire safety problem within New Zealand's building stock has taken a long time to reach the point where, where industry itself has recognised that change is necessary. And without change, uh, driven by ourselves, by the industry, that change would be forced upon it. There's a number of reasons why that's taken so long, but in New Zealand, it's probably fair to say that we've had a very good uh, run of low fatalities and really no significant fires uh, that have been attributed to passive fire protection failures. And so recognition of the problem has been allowed to uh, continue for quite some time. But as we've, kind of, uh, as we've come to recognize uh, We've got many similarities with the problems that have been seen overseas, together with the fact that New Zealand is a very small marketplace and not a particularly mature marketplace, and that we're also decades behind some jurisdictions. And so what we're trying to do now in recent years to resolve the problem is, is that education uh, side of things and recognition that we are partly through and in this transition phase to resolving uh, the problem that we see. So in terms of me working for a building consent authority, uh, just one aspect that we've talked about in terms of the foundation of uh, delivering good passive fire protection, for example, the design documentation. It's been, regular, it's been a common place for a number of years and it's probably still true today to say that we can see many designs uh, being delivered in many different ways. And for example, in terms of the design documentation and the quality differences that we see between various projects. As you can see here, we can see uh, specifications or reports talking about passive that range for anything from 10 words, uh, the use of uh, out of date uh, testing standards and incorrect performance specifications, 
uh, all the way through to very detailed drawings and specifications and, and, signi and significant amounts of effort being put into trying to make sure that the design of passive uh, is done is done at the level commensurate with the complexity of the building. But it's probably fair to say that we are still struggling even at the most fundamental level to ensure that we're getting good quality design documentation and good quality uh, passive specifications. So if we look at the passive timeline uh, from, from when I started in New Zealand and way back to when we first started seeing some information coming through in terms of the situation back in 2005, You'll see there that we really only, or there is, or there is really, from my perspective, only two things that we could really point to uh, over that first ten-year period. But then, if we, if we, if we come to the, uh, the the last five years, you'll start to see that there's a significant body of work that's now starting to come online to resolve some of these issues. So, if we focus on the last four years, you'll see that a lot of work has gone on. Uh, what you'll see there is we started in 2017 with the first of the documents coming online with the brand's good practice guide to uh, passive fire protection. We also then over that next course of the year uh, with myself at Auckland Council uh, in association with brands started a project to look at the, uh, the risk of non-compliant fire stopping and try and get a handle on what the actual risks were with the sort of problems that we were seeing. We then, saw, we then saw on a specific note is the creation of the uh, Fire Protection Association of New Zealand Passive Fire Protection System Register of Products uh, in, in 2018. That, that document and that passive register has since been revised seven times and is about to go fully electronic in terms of a searchable register uh, and includes most of the fire stopping products available in New Zealand, which is important from our perspective because before before that register was created, we didn't really have anything. And, and from a design perspective and from an industry perspective, particularly from an architectural and fire engineering perspective, it was very difficult and challenging uh, for designers to actually uh, choose and pick uh, passive products without having any of the systems in place that we see overseas or any of the, uh, or any of the tools available uh, to allow you to uh, confidently choose uh, compliant passive uh, fire systems for the right the right environment in which you're you're needing them. Uh, following on following on from that, then we see after uh, the Auckland Council, we produced a position statement to try and cement what our requirements were as a regulatory authority in terms of the design documentation and delivery of passive fire protection. We then start to see a flurry of documents per, per, uh, that have been worked on over the subsequent years uh, provided by the Fire Protection Association. Uh, and so there's a number of those documents, including passive fire fundamentals, the fire smoke stopping methodology, guides to smoke stopping. Uh, and importantly, in what is quite a major uh, body of work was the code of practice for intumescent coatings. Then what we've seen over the last two years is the education and training coming, coming online to support the industry uh, to deliver passive. So in New Zealand, uh, previously, the availability of education and training in passive fire protection was, until recent times, really very lacking, uh, with the government really putting a reliance on the industry to self-regulate. Uh, we recognise that there was courses available internationally and examinations such as the IFE and ASFP examinations. However, previously in New Zealand, there was really nothing uh, locally available and the industry had, hadn't really gone or recognized that there was a need to have uh, localized education and tra training specifically available uh, to those in the industry. So to address this issue, the Fire Protection Association in association with Competence, who are one of our industry training advisors, uh, got together to deliver a range of passive fire qualifications, uh, which were launched in 2017. So there's, there's two levels of, of qualifications uh, that you can get there uh, from both a, an installation at level three and at level four for uh, inspe uh, an inspection level. Uh, 
and, and of particular relevance and, and, and what is what is turning out to be really very positive in the last year uh, in 2020 we saw nearly 800 learners take up those uh, qualifications which was really reflecting the the absolute need and desire for the industry to have education and training provided to it that could be recognized uh, specifically we created uh, last year the passive fire protection installation and inspection certificate uh, and last year we had over 200 uh, people take up uh, those uh, those certificates uh, which is important because uh, it's very difficult or it was very difficult and still remains very difficult in terms of certainly for a regulator uh, and people in the industry to to get recognition of people who are installers and inspectors when when previously there was uh, very little available and just last year uh, the institution of fire engineers new zealand branch we've been working on an initiative to launch a new zealand diploma in fire engineering which includes passive papers as part of that which got launched last year and at the moment we have uh, from that course being launched late last year almost 200 people uh, that have now enrolled to take a diploma level course in fire engineering in new zealand uh, one thing that we've done that may be of particular interest to listeners in the work uh, in the field of passive is is work and the research that we've done to try and determine the extent of and risk associated with non-compliant fire stopping we in New Zealand, uh, in the Building Act, when you're doing work on or undertaking work in, on an existing building, our Building Act doesn't require that the existing building be brought up to new building standard. The new building work that's going on has to be uh, fully compliant, but in terms of the existing building, you only have to demonstrate compliance to this as near as reasonably practicable level. Uh, so when we're dealing with existing buildings, um, particularly those buildings that have gone through significant upgrades or where there's been significant items uh, discovered with regards to passive fire protection, we had been in a situation where there was a lack of understanding and very little guidance provided as to what near as reasonably practical guidance uh, provided with regards or what, what that actually meant with regards to passive fire protection. So as part of the work done with the uh, Building Research Association of New Zealand, uh, we came up with and developed a passive fire risk assessment tool that gives designers and engineers a means to assess uh, passive fire protection, existing passive fire protection, including historic and potentially uh, uh, passive systems that aren't necessarily compliant to today's standards. Uh, a tool to provide a risk assessment of that so that they can then make informed decisions as to what remediation work they're going to be, uh, they, they, can, they can undertake or need to undertake to demonstrate compliance with our Building Act. So in terms of, in terms of our journey, so that's kind of uh, the, the good news in terms of where we've been in terms of uh, releasing documentation, putting training in place, and what we've managed to achieve over the last four years. But there needs to be recognition that we're still in the transition period so there's still quite a lot of work to be done uh, as i've said education and training are essential and it's recognized that we're really only just starting on the education and training pathway and so it's going to take some years before that embeds itself uh, and we have a sufficient capacity in the marketplace to ensure that everyone working in the passive fire industry is qualified and experienced uh, and of course, that's that works at all levels. It's not just installers and inspectors, but it's it's at both. Uh, well, it's at all levels, including the designers, installers, inspectors, and at the regulatory level, so that we can all raise the standards together. Uh, we've also recognised that there's uh, the the importance of having sufficient testing facilities, and also support uh, is uh, necessary to support the passive fire industry, uh, because it's not always it's not always uh, possible or feasible to choose a fully compliant off the shelf system for every single situation that's being designed and particularly in a performance based environment so without sufficient testing facilities and without sufficient regulatory support uh, to guide people and, and provide advice including things with like engineering judgments and opinions uh, some of those items can become quite challenging uh, in terms of the product register and design support, improvements are ongoing in that field and we should see that go fully electronic at some point shortly. 
We also have work going on that's been initiated with regards to providing some inspection guidance to support people with how you should be inspecting buildings under the New Zealand regulatory framework. Uh, and as we'll hear from Matthew later on, uh, underwriters laboratories have recently expanded their third party certification scheme with the ULAU mark in Australia. Uh, and, and we're hoping obviously that uh, that that extends into New Zealand because at the moment we have no third party product certification schemes that are relevant to the passive fire industry and products at the moment. And so we're quite lacking in that field. So that will provide a significant uh, help to the industry. Uh, and lastly, we may also start seeing uh, accreditation for inspection companies. So again, we have uh, a number of people who are effectively running inspection companies and are undertaking inspections for various reasons. But at the moment, again, there is limited recognition of those people and, and nothing at the moment in time that, that, that talks to accreditation of those, uh, those people and the quality assurance associated with the work that we're doing. So hopefully that work will, will, will be implemented at some point in the future. So that about wraps it up for me. Uh, and what I wanted to say, so I'll, I'll leave I'll leave it there with uh, just a couple of references to some of those documents I've uh, talked about today. Uh, so thank you very much.